Okay, let's uh, make a start. It's just after 10 o'clock. Welcome everybody to uh, this uh, Breeze seminar on injectable prep. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of Breeze, it's the it's New South Wales Health Department's funded research program, the full name being the Bloodborne Virus and STI Research Intervention and Strategic Evaluation um, Program. Uh, and today's topic is on injectable prep. Um, my name is Andrew Grulick. I'm the head of the HIV Epidemiology and Prevention Program at the Kirby, and along with um, Professor Carla Trelaw, I'm one of the two co-directors of this research program. Before we make a start today, I would like to acknowledge that all of us around uh, New South Wales, and even more broadly, are coming today from unceded uh, Indigenous land. I'm coming from the lands of the Bedigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and to also acknowledge any Aboriginal people who might be joining us today. The format of today's discussion is one we've used in Breeze before. Uh, we have a research presentation for about 20 minutes. We then have a community respondent for uh, up to 10 minutes and a cl clinical respondent for 10 minutes. And we end up with about hopefully 15 minutes for your questions uh, and a Q&A session. With the Q&A, we, we, we'll, uh, we do have a relatively large number of participants. So you can either use the hand up function and I can call on you to give the question, or you can write your questions into the chat function where we'll be trying to keep an eye uh, on that. So um, injectable prep, uh, it's, you know, prep is something that has dominated our field of HIV prevention or come to dominate it since um, only in, in the, really in the last six years since we started rollout here in New South Wales. Personally, I find it hard to remember a time in HIV prevention before PrEP now. It's, it's so dominant in prevention in this field. And we are coming up to a new revolution in PrEP, and that is the availability of longer acting forms uh, of PrEP. And today's talk is about one of those, of the first cab off the rank, if you like, uh, of injectable PrEP. Um, our three presenters, I'll briefly introduce them now before I call on uh, them to speak. Our first presenter is Dr. Ben Babington, uh, who is from the HIV Ep Epidemiology and Prevention Program at the Kirby Institute, and Ben leads research uh, on PrEP at the Kirby. Uh, our community respondent today is Mr. Matthew Vaughan, uh, and Matt is the Director of HIV and Sexual Health, Health Division at ACON. And our clinician respondent today is uh, Dr. Anna McNulty, Director of the City Sexual Health Centre. So a terrific bunch of speakers, I'm sure you'll agree. And with that, I would now like to hand over to you, Ben, for your present, your research presentation on injectable prep. Great, thanks, Andrew. So is that showing for everybody? Great. Yes, it is, Ben. Yep. Excellent. So I would also just like to acknowledge that I'm on the also on the lands of the medical people of the Euro Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present. So let's get into it, injectable prep. So as we know, we've been on quite a journey with prep. Um, with we've had availability of oral prep now for quite some time. And as Andrew said, it's really about this last six years that we've had oral prep in the Australian context. Um, and since 2018 so on um, the, the payback approval with um, oral prep. And of course, we have the two forms of oral prep, daily oral and on-demand oral. And these are now being quite widely used in the community uh, with oral prep, uh, on-demand oral prep accounting for about 20% of the oral prep users. Um, some new products are coming down the pipeline, of course. Um, so the first of those was actually a depivirine vaginal ring, um, which is about 50% efficacious. Uh, this is unlikely to be really rolled out in Australia, but it's just important to mention because it is going to be happening in sub-Saharan Africa in a big way um, over the coming years. And then the very next one that came along is long-acting injectable carbotegravir, which I'll refer to as CAB-LA, just for um, brevity. And then under investigation still, we have a few other long-acting options coming down the pipeline. There's a six-monthly injectable called lenacapavir, uh, which is under investigation now. There's also a monthly oral pill called Islatravir, which is also under investigation in phase three clinical trials. And then a little bit further down is um, poten the potential for implants. Um, so this could be a, a few different drugs being explored for this. Um, this would be an insert um, probably into the arm. And there's also opportunities here for multi-purpose technologies with contraception. So really today we're talking about injectable prep. So it's the one that we has, has kind of been proven, um, which is CAB-LA and then also lenacapavir, which is potentially coming down the pipeline. 
So CABLA is involves one intramuscular injection into the buttock every eight weeks. It's been proven efficacious in two randomized clinical trials, and I'll go through those data in a minute. Um, it is approved and available in the USA, and people actually have started to use that in the USA. It's recently approved in Australia, but um, it's not yet available in Australia. Lenacapavir is a slightly different product. Um, this is a subcutaneous injection that would only be needed to be done every six months. This is currently in phase three trials um, called Purpose 1 and Purpose 2. Uh, these trials were uh, paused um, last year and they've because of some issues with the glass files, and they've recently been restarted. And um, we're not really sure how long it will take for the trials to run, but they're very large, several thousand participants in, um, in the, each of the arms. And so it could be several years before we get the efficacy data from those, the, the, those two trials. So um, I'll be focusing really on CAMLA today because that's the one that um, we really will be focusing on for the next sort of four to six years. So there were two trials that looked at this, um, HP10083, which is in MSM and transgender women, and 084, which was in the cisgender women in five African countries. The trials were both designed in a very similar way. So they were double blind, double dummy, active controlled trials. So what this meant was that every person in the trial was given an injection eight, every eight weeks, and every person in the trial was asked to take a pill every single day. Um, but in each of the two arms, one of those two products was a placebo. So that's why they call it an active controlled trial because there was no actual placebo product in the mix. At the end of the trial, um, every participant was then asked to go on to oral TDF-FTC, what we have currently available, for up to sort of a year or more um, at the end of the trial. So these trials both found that injectable CAB-LA and oral TDF-FTC were both highly effective. So if you were to compare both of these products to the background incidents that would have happened without any PrEP, there was a big suppression of um, infections in both arms of the trial. But because these were active control trials and they're comparing two different products, that's the two bars that we have on each of these graphs here. So in 083, the TDF-FTC arm um, had an incidence rate of 1.22 per 100 person years, um, and there were 39 infections, compared to only 13 infections in the CAB-LA arm for an incidence rate of 0.41. And that equates to a risk reduction of 66%. Similar results in the trial in cisgender women, only slightly better, where the uh, CAB-LA injections performed even better than they did in the MSM trial with an 89% reduction in risk. Both studies confirm that CAB-LA is well tolerated, it has an acceptable safety profile and can increase adherence. Um, the injection site reactions were the most common um, kind of adverse event that was found, but injection site reactions led to very few discontinuations. There was only about 2% in the MSM trial and zero in the cisgender women trial. Now this product has a long half-life, which is an advantage and a disadvantage. So the advantage obviously of a long half-life is the ongoing protection, uh, the long acting protection. But it also means that it increases the length of time up to 12 months or longer that cab -LA remains in the body after the final injection. And this is known as the pharmacokinetic tail. And what this means is that during that tail, people will have some drug in their body, but not enough drug to actually prevent them from acquiring HIV. So it's really important to be thinking about how they, these individuals protect themselves in that tail. And that's why the trials asked every participant in those trials to use oral prep for a year after the trial. There were a very small number of breakthrough infections, which refers to an HIV seroconversion despite on-time CAB-LA infections. Um, there were four in the men's trial and zero in the women's trial, which is great news for women. And this is going to be a product that will be very widely, widely used in sub-Saharan Africa. There were also a very small number of um, resistance mutations to the class of drug that cab belongs to. And again, they were only identified in the MSM trial, not the women's trial. Um, at the moment, the precise time to onset of protection after the first injection is, is a bit unknown. They, the pharmacokinetic data suggests that it's probably around three days, but it's not known whether it actually could be protective prior to three days, like within the first three days. I think more research is needed on that. And we've found out recently at the AIDS 2022 conference in Montreal that it is safe for trans people taking gender affirming hormones um, and that hormones have no impact on the cab levels in the body, which means that trans people who are taking hormones can feel safe that they'll be protected from HIV when using this product. As I mentioned, this has been approved by the TGA in Australia. This was very recent in August. Um, and some of the key information from the registered product information, 
is that um, people need to have a documented HIV negative test before they initiate their first injection in accordance with applicable guidelines. Of course, we don't have applicable guidelines yet for this product, but Asham, I'm sure we'll be working on those soon. Unlike in the USA, um, we do not require RNA testing, which is a more sensitive form of HIV test as they do in the USA. Um, so the reason they did that in the USA is because there were some infections that were that happened within the context of the trial that weren't picked up by regular sort of third generation testing, which was more rapid testing that was being used. Um, in the WHO and obviously the TGA have sort of said, well, we're not really sure what the public health benefit would be of requiring everybody to have this much more expensive and more sensitive test. And I think in a context like Australia, where we have widespread use of fourth generation uh, laboratory testing, there's sort of there's probably minimal benefit that we would get from requiring RNA testing. So it's great news that the TGA didn't require this. And it's probably going to be that the USA remains a bit of an outlier there. Um, HIV testing should be conducted at least every three months while in injections. There is the option for an oral lead-in where the person actually takes oral tablets of cab, -cab um, for 28 days before they get their first injection. What they're finding in the USA is that most people are choosing not to do the oral lead-in. Um, oral tablets can also be used to cover one planned missed injection. So if the person knows they're going to be away for the, the scheduled injection, they can be given some oral tablets and they can cover that period. Um, if injections are missed or there are two or more planned missed injections, the initiation process needs to start again, unless the person has been completely covered by oral tablets during the entire period. And in terms of what that schedule is, if we assume no oral lead-in, which we think is going to be most people, the schedule of injection would be the first one, another one one month later, and then two monthly thereafter. The injection window is relatively tight. So it's seven days before and seven days after the scheduled injection. So only 14 days. I um, mean, and injections should be administered by a healthcare professional, but the guidance, the, the TGA uh, product information does not say, not define what a healthcare professional is. Um, and it also makes this point about the tail that I mentioned before that alternative use forms of PrEP should be considered following discontinuation. So what are we doing in Australia? So uh, we have been funded by Vive Health Healthcare, the product maker, and also some other sources, including the New South Wales Ministry of Health and the Australian government, to lead some uh, different uh, research activities to kind of prepare for Cabela, the introduction of Cabela into Australia. This included a scoping literature review, interviews with stakeholders and service providers, coded co-design workshops with end users and uh, clinicians, and then a preferences survey. We wrote all of this up into a discussion paper. And if you'd like a copy of that, if you don't have one already, just let me know. We then did a consultation, which we have just finished. Um, and then moving then onto a grant application and a protocol. And then hopefully this will lead into some kind of implementation trial. So just in terms of what we found, uh, we did a, our staff member, Bella Bushby, did a very large scale literature review of everything published on Cabalet so far. They found that willingness to use and interest in using injectable PrEP is very high amongst most populations. And in many studies, it's actually the top preference that people actually report. They like that it might be easier to use compared to a daily pill. There's convenience, improved adherence, privacy and discreteness, and just preferring injections over, over pills. There were some concerns, of course, fear of needles, potential side effects. And again, you can't take the drug out of the body once it's been put in. So people are concerned about that. Logistical issues with the frequency of visits required, increased clinic attendance, and potential interactions with other medicines. In Australia, we've done a little bit of previous research on preferences into this. And again, we've generally found very high interest in long-acting injectable prep, sometimes the highest. Um, when we added in more recently the idea of a monthly oral pill, that actually actually ended up jumping to the top of the list for most people. Um, but that was back in 2021. And then this year we did this very large scale survey in Australia and in 15 countries across Asia, asking about the preferences around PrEP. Um, and this is just the Australian data here. We found very high interest in long acting injectable PrEP at over 50%, but the highest interest overall actually was in the monthly oral pills. But the top preference was equal for the monthly pill at just over a quarter and long acting injections at just over a quarter. But when given the choice between a two monthly option and a six monthly option, 86% preferred the six monthly injections. So it really, I think, shows that Cabela, the, the idea, there's a lot of interest in long acting forms of PrEP. So people might be very interested in Cabela for the next few years, but then once lenacapavir comes along, if it's proven efficacious, people would likely want to switch to that. 
In our qualitative interviews, we did 27 interviews with prep service providers and stakeholders. Again, we found general support for uh, increased choice and new long-acting options, including Cabellone. Um, it was There was a belief that this product would perhaps be best targeted for patients with existing contraindications to oral prep, struggles with adherence, or who need a more discreet choice. Uh, many implementation challenges were discussed, and I'll get onto those in more detail late, later. Um, and many service providers suggested ways to address these challenges and were interested in very innovative models of care, including nurse lab models, digital technologies, and also self-injection, the, the potential for self-injection. We also did uh, three co-design workshops with PrEP users and potential users and one with service providers. To date, we've got some more coming up. Again, widespread general support for this, but also some ambivalence about this particular product. Um, again, very similar. It was seen as appropriate for similar groups that I just mentioned. Although when we talked to the end user groups, they thought there might be a wider interest amongst those already using PrEP rather than those people who have not yet ever started PrEP. Um, they mentioned a lot of issues that they're uncertain about. Um, and service providers stated that they don't currently have in-clinic systems to identify PrEP patients with suboptimal adherence or for poor follow-up to PrEP. So doing an audit of the, to try to actually find those patients in the clinic would be quite resource intensive, and they kind of had some concerns about that. There was widespread support for the future exploration of models using self-administration. And actually, in our survey, we found that 15% of uh, gay and bisexual men reported they will be interested in uh, self-administration. So let's move on to the research priorities for future um, prep uh, Cabellet implementation in Australia. So the first thing I want to start on is this whole question of access. So potentially anyone who is at risk of acquiring HIV could benefit from increased choice um, that's offered by this product um, and obviously in the future by other new long-acting PrEP modalities. What I'm trying to say here is that basically anybody who's currently taking PrEP could potentially benefit from this product. However, there are going to be issues with access to CabLA in Australia. The timeline to availability of the full price drug is currently uncertain. Uh, Vive estimates it wouldn't be until at least the middle of next year, and we currently don't know how expensive it would be to actually buy a private script, um, buy this drug on a private script. Um, CabLA is really not going to be accessible at a large scale unless it's approved for subsidy by payback. And obviously, the payback um, timeline for application is not yet determined. We don't know when Vive is going to put the application in. And of course, we don't know the outcome. As we found with oral prep, um, it might take a few rounds of submissions um, and some sort of argy-bargy there and negotiations before this gets approved, if it ever gets approved. Even if payback approval is forthcoming, it is unlikely to be for anyone who wants to use it. So it's likely to be positioned as a form of prep specifically for people who cannot take or who have struggled to effectively take oral prep or TFFTC prep. Um, so we might think about this in terms of being a restricted form of prep or like they um, refer to with ARVs, almost like a second line form of prep. And Australia is really gonna be the first country to grapple with this because this is not the case in the USA where it's basically available for anyone who can either afford it or has private insurance. Um, but there are many countries like Australia that do fund medicines on the basis of cost effectiveness. And so in many countries, particularly Europe, maybe Canada, some other places uh, are likely to have this same issue that we have around this being potentially a second line form of prep. So how might we design eligibility criteria for CABLA? Obviously, first, it makes sense that the patient should be considered suitable for PrEP based on the HIV risk eligibility criteria in the current national PrEP guidelines. And here's some of those risk criteria just on the screen, but I'm sure we're all very familiar with those. Second, we think that people who have contraindications to the use of oral TDF-FTC PrEP should be eligible. So we might define this as people who have the estimated uh, GFR that's well established to be below 60 mils. Um, or having low bone mineral density in the range of osteopenia or osteoporosis based on a bone mineral density scan. This is likely to be a very small proportion of people who would want to use PrEP though, so we need to keep that in mind. But third, eligibility could perhaps be extended to people who the clinician believes will not be able to achieve effective or adequate levels of protection from HIV if Cabillet was withheld from them. The challenge here is to determine a set of criteria or examples for this. These criteria need to be easily understood by both patients and, and, uh, and service providers, easily imp implementable in busy clinical contexts, able to be communicated to the community, and they need to be acceptable to clinicians, the community, the drug ma manufacturer, and of course, to payback. 
And we really don't know yet what payback is going to think of all of this. Some examples could include some things like a clinical history of, of failure to adhere or struggles with adhere, adherence to oral prep, a clinical history of inconsistent use of oral prep with episodes of condomless intercourse or STIs when not on prep. There could be people who are ceasing or recommencing oral prep due to struggles with adherence. It could be that a patient reports a really strong belief that they will not be able to adhere to oral prep in the future. Um, it could be that patients report wanting to cease oral prep despite evidence of ongoing HIV acquisition risk. They might have privacy concerns or the risk of stigma, stigma and discrimination. They might have a clinical history of ongoing side effects that are not at that really high level of side effects that would preclude the use of oral prep, but just really annoying side effects, such as gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, headaches, fatigue, and so on. And it could be also particularly interesting for people who need coverage for a specific period. So they might not be interested in sort of ongoing use, but they might have travel, for example, to a country where same-sex behavior is illegal and they don't want to carry around a bottle of pills or where HIV stigma is really intense, or there might be some work requirements that preclude predictable oral prep adherence. So they're just some uh, examples. We don't want to get too bogged down into specifically what's on the slide, but just to give a flavor of the kinds of things that we were thinking about. And finally, following what the product information says, uh, we may need to add something along the lines of patients who want to go onto these injections will need to agree that they can abide by the follow-up schedule, which is coming into the clinic every two months. And this is going to require good patient education to ensure the potential users understand this properly. So in terms of what we're planning for a potential implementation trial of this product, the, I, I'll just point out here that the field of implementation science divides research questions into two kind of categories. You have the questions around effectiveness, safety, and clinical outcomes. And these focus on the characteristics of the drug, how well it works in the real world, the incidence of various infections, adherence, drug resistance, serious adverse events, and so on. These are the kinds of things that are typically uh, measured in the context of a normal clinical trial. But in, in an implementation science trial, we also look at things that are implementation related. So these focus on things like acceptability to patients and providers, feasibility, appropriateness, how well it's being implemented, strategies to support the implementation. And these can be measured at both the, ind the individual patient level and also at the level of clinic staff and clinics. So in terms of the effectiveness, safety and clinical questions that we've been thinking about, these are the kinds of typical ones that would be included in any trial of a new drug. So we'd be interested in looking at the proportion of on-time infection and on-time injections in patients who are taking CAB-LA. And we think this might be good as a primary outcome for a potential study. We, of course, would look at HIV incidence, STI incidence, and incidence of patterns of drug resistance in people who acquire HIV. Um, we would look at serious adverse events. Of course, like all of our studies, we'd look at sexual behaviors. Um, we'd want to look at people who continue the injections, who cease the injections, or who switch back to oral prep. And those who cease the injections, we'd want to definitely monitor that tail very well to see how do they adhere to prep or to condoms, or, um, and do they have any unprotected condomless intercourse during that year that could put them at risk of drug resistance, for example. Um, we'd want to look at uh, planned and unplanned missed injections and visits and the reasons for those and patient factors and clinic factors associated with late injections. In terms of the implementation outcomes, I won't go through this in detail, we've already discussed this. There's a range of different um, things that we want to look at, including acceptability, uh, how well it's being adopted within the, these different settings, the feasibility of, of this product and all the protocols associated with the product, the appropriateness of the product, how well it fits, how is it suitable to these different environments, uh, the fidelity, which means how well it's actually been implemented um, and is it following the protocol that's set out, um, the degree to which the intervention is being integrated into the service setting, the cost, uh, whether people make modifications to the way they, to the protocol and the strategies that they use to, to implement the product, and satisfaction amongst PrEP users. Do they like this more or less than people who are using oral TDFFTC? And to finish off, I'll go through some potential implementation issues that have really come up in the context of all our formative work and also in those consultations that I mentioned before. So there are a lot of concerns about managing clinical visits and administering the ejections. So what's actually the best way to run the clinic visits from the beginning right to the end? And this might look different for initiation visits versus follow-up visits. And there's a question of how much do we mandate in a kind of protocol versus just letting clinics work out what they want to do. And then we just sort of observe that over time and, and make measurements on that. 
As I mentioned before, it will be important to measure modifications to practice over time. And this all means that this also means that different clinics might be able to learn from experiences from other clinics. So if the clinics really learn something works a lot better, we might then want to um, roll that out across all the clinics that are participating. And there's an important question within the clinic of who actually should and can give the injections. So obviously doctors, we'd be thinking about nurses here. There are some questions about whether you could train up some other types of people like uh, peers, for example, in peer-based settings to actually give the injections. Would this be possible? Um, and how would we actually ensure a high quality level of care there? There's a lot of concerns about HIV testing and the question of whether we can actually do same day initiation with this product. So at the moment, obviously with oral prep, we do allow same day initiation and various clinics have different ways that they manage this within their own settings. But the TGA product information clearly says that a documented HIV negative test result is needed before the first injection. So there's some questions, how recent does this test result need to be? Could that look different for different individuals? So if someone sort of has had a test result two weeks ago, and they really swear black and blue that they've had no risk episodes since then, could you actually use that test result from two weeks ago? Or do you actually need to always test at baseline? Is it gonna be possible to allow same day initiation depending on all these questions? Um, could there potentially be a role for rapid antibody antigen tests um, in, in this? Could it be that some individuals might be given a rapid test as well as a blood draw for a fourth generation lab test? They could initiate, be given the injection on the first day based on the result of the rapid test, and if they did end up coming back um, positive, which would be a very small minority of people, then uh, we'd ask them to get onto uh, another form of pro uh, treatment immediately. In terms of STI testing, we've got a mismatch between the injection schedule, which is two months, and the HIV STI testing, which is three months. Do people need to be tested at every visit? That's a question that people are interested in. There's a lot of questions about the injection window and missed injections. It's a very tight window, as I said before, of only 14 days. This has been highlighted as a challenge. Is there any flexibility here? How will clinics and patients deal with unplanned missed injections? Because it takes a very organized person to be able to know when they're gonna be away and call up a clinic and say, hey, I'm not gonna miss this injection, what should I do? And a big question for our service providers is how much responsibility will clinics have for the follow-up of their patients? Right now with oral prep, the clinics don't have a lot of responsibility. They give out a, a script, and the person decides when they want to come back. Um, but would something like an injectable form of PrEP require a little bit more follow-up? Could technological solutions help with follow-up? Just skip that one. There's some questions about how this drug will be dispensed. Um, how will they pick up, receive their prescriptions and pick up the drug? Will it be at pharmacies or will it just be at the clinic? Should they be required to pay for the drug in a research trial, which makes it more real world, but obviously it puts a burden on patients? Um, how will the dispensing of the oral tablets be organized? Um, which, because it, it's likely to not be a drug that's used widely, so it's unlikely that many pharmacies would actually stock that. So should this be something that the clinics just have? There's gonna be a lot of questions about patient and community messaging. Um, we do know that the way that things are described to patients by clinicians um, have big impacts on the patient's choice to uptake products. And this is gonna be the same with this product. There's a lot of complex issues here that are gonna to need to be explained to patients. Um, and what we might do in the context of a trial is perhaps even develop a few different versions of educational materials and even test them against each other. We've got some thinking to do around that. Finally, patient selection. So how should clinics identify patients that are appropriate for this product? Will this identification process be costly and time consuming? The feedback from the treatment version of this product, which is called Cabanuva and Cabela as PrEP in the US, says that the initial thoughts that clinicians often had about who this who might be suitable for this product ended up not really being the people that they ended up giving the product to. So they kind of thought maybe this would be a great product for people who have some challenges in their lives, maybe a little bit more chaotic, um, and maybe an injection would be better for them because they don't have to take a daily pill. But if you're having to commit to coming to in a clinic every two months, you need to be actually fairly well organized. So I'll just finish my last slide here. So obviously this is an effective new form of PrEP. It's the first of a new suite of long-acting PrEP agents, but it does need to be pointed out that this is gonna be the only form of long-acting PrEP available for the next four to six, maybe even more years. So we need to think about really, do we need to make access to this available for people who really need it in that meantime? Members of key populations have high levels of interest in this, um, in this product, but they would prefer six monthly injections over two monthly. All new PrEP products are going to face these accessibility challenges for countries like Australia, which fund medicines on the basis of cost effectiveness. And we're going to have to figure this out for all the new PrEP products that come down the pipeline. 
And there are obviously many implementation questions that need further work, and that's why we need implementation science trials. So we'll just end there to acknowledge the rest of the project team, all the study participants of all our various studies, a few different indiv individuals there, and of course, our funders. Thanks very much. Great, thank you for that comprehensive overview, Ben, of, of injectable prep from the research point of view. And now for a community response to that, I'll hand over to Matt Vaughan. Thanks very much, Andrew. And let's see if this, uh, works. Share. Can I just check that those yes. slides are displaying? Yes, perfect. perfect, Matt. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, that's a really good overview on injectable prep, and uh, you definitely are a tough act to follow. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Matthew Vaughan. I'm the Director for HIV and Sexual Health at ACON. And I've been asked to share with you some of the community perspectives on injectable PrEP, the daily pill that prevents HIV. Actually, we're going to need to spend a bit of time updating our headline and messaging on this. I think particularly, you know, it's not going to be a daily dose anymore. And with injectable prep, it's likely not even to be a pill. So let's uh, try that again. Oh, ah, there we go. I've been asked to share with you community perspectives on injectable prep, the powerful HIV prevention option. Thankfully, the alliteration still works. In New South Wales, we've had a lot of success in our messaging around and or messaging and demand generation of prep. Through Epic New South Wales, we saw uh, enrollment surpass the original estimates of 3,700 in record breaking time, reaching almost 10,000 people before the study ended. And if there's one thing that we've learned from this, it's the gay men like options and the ability to choose, whether that's through their HIV prevention strategy or whether that's through their potential sex partners. Let's face it. Nobody wants to be locked into that one option for the rest of their life. There you are, I said it. And while we know that there's a large amount of people in New South Wales who are taking PrEP by oral medication, with many still taking it daily, it's injectable PrEP and the promise that it provides that gives us a glimpse into the future of HIV prevention. And while it's very easy to get caught up in that promise, I think we have to be realist, realistic about what lies ahead. First of all, as Ben said, it's cost. It's likely that this drug is going to cost an astronomical amount. And somewhere along the lines, someone is going to have to pay for it, either by the government through a PBS listing, but the government already has a very affordable and cost-effective drug in the form of TDFFTC, as Ben said. So it's quite obvious that for the vast majority of people, this is gonna be, it's, or it's very likely that this is not gonna be available for the vast majority of people. So if the government doesn't pay for it, it's gonna have to be the end user. And while gay men love the option of choice and love having choices to choose from, you could, uh, and you could argue that they have a highly disposable income, I have to say that I'm not convinced that guys will be prepared to pay the asking price for something like this. Remember when PrEP was listed on the PBS and people had to start paying the $40 per month for a drug that they used to get for free? That was seen as a significant barrier and prompted access and affordability schemes for people to get PrEP that otherwise couldn't afford it or perhaps that didn't want to pay the $40. In Australia, there's an expectation that HIV preventions should be free. And that's likely because we've distributed large amounts of condoms to the masses over the years. And if it's not going to be free, then there's an expectation that it should be highly subsidized by the government. Um, so let's put cost aside, aside for a moment. 
uh, and imagine that we all live in a utopia and that for some magical reason, cost isn't going to be an issue. As someone who's spent the better part of their career convincing gay men to engage with sexual health services, I think I can safely say that asking otherwise healthy people to come in and get an injection every two months is going to be a difficult ask. Even for the most health engaged person, let alone for people who might be considered harder to reach or less engaged with health services, asking them to come in for you know, a bi-monthly injection is gonna be difficult. People want to engage with services less, not more. And as Ben said, there's been a lot more uh, interest in options that require uh, less frequent injections or even uh, less frequent oral medications. People want options, uh, but they want options that require them with less visits and taking less medications. And I think that's especially true following a global pandemic and an outbreak of monkeypox. And so while I know this hasn't been the most optimistic presentation, I suppose for my final slide, I wanna, I wanna, sorry. And I suppose for my final slide, I wanna go back to my original question. Is this going to be the ma magical or, you know, the miracle drug that gets the masses onto PrEP? Perhaps not. Uh, perhaps it is, but my, as my earlier statement said, it's not so much about this drug, but it's the promise of drugs that might come ahead uh, that lead us or that make us think about the future of HIV prevention and the options that will be available to communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, yeah, it's great that you're challenging us to think about the problems because uh, we don't want to pretend that this is a panacea and it's it's really important that we raise these issues today. And that's probably a good way to introduce our next speaker, um, Anna McNulty, uh, um, who of course leads a very, very busy sexual health clinic. Um, and it'd be great to get your perspectives on, on this, Anna. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Andrew, and to Ben and Matt for, for what they've said. I'll, I'll actually keep my comments quite short because I think most of what I was going to identify as issues at a, at a, in a clinical context have already been identified, in particularly in Brent, Ben's presentation, but also some of what Matt said. So, I mean, the things that um, came to mind when I was thinking about this issue and talking internally to the other doctors are really around, uh, first of all, three things. I guess overarching things would be the criteria for eligibility, um, the operationalizing of um, the administration of it, and some uncertainties, I suppose, that are inevitable, but, you know, do probably, um, you know, influence our thinking. Um, with regard to the criteria that are, you know, being proposed, I think everyone would agree, every clinician would agree, it's, it's pretty easy to say um, that someone is eligible based on their renal or bone toxicity issues. That's, that's a bit of a no-brainer. But the kind of criteria around um, adherence or um, not wanting to take oral pills are much harder um, to measure and really rely on the individual's report, naturally enough. And doctors hate being gatekeepers. So they're not going to challenge someone who says, I don't want to take pills. I mean, if we think about, you know, the initial rollout of the monkeypox vaccines in New South Wales, no one was required to bring in their airline ticket to prove they were travelling overseas. So I think that... Inevitably, whoever wants it will get it. Um, and that's um, a reality of how, you know, oral prep rolled out. There are all these criteria that we were originally meant to adhere to that really quick, pretty quickly evolved into if you want prep, then you can have it, even if on the face of it you were seemingly low risk or didn't meet the criteria in the ASHM guidelines. So that then goes to the question of what demand there'll be, which is obviously a, you know, an area of uncertainty and you know, has been identified by the work to date that, you know, that there's much um, more substantial interest in the six monthly injection. Um, and in our experience here at SSHC, um, the demand for Cabinuva has been minimal, um, which is you know, similar schedule of it around implementation. We've only got two people on Cabinuva. And um, so there may be, you could argue, 
you know, limited demand for um, Cab LA. It's just an uncertainty that um, we can't do. We can only wait and see, I suppose. Around the operationalising of it, it, that would be a huge burden on clinics, publicly funded clinics. Um, it's uh, um, or most clinics are already overwhelmed with men coming in for the three monthly scripts for oral prep, despite big efforts to um, try and shift some of that activity into the private sector with the reduction in bulk billing. It's been very hard to sort of encourage men uh, to move across to seeing a GP. And we're always concerned that um, we don't want men to drop off it because of that. So how do we balance that keeping men um, on uh, their prep versus the costs that they would in, in they would um, have to pay if they went to a GP. But I think if um, prep um, uh, if Cab LA does become uh, is an implementable in clinics, then it would be only those with Medicare. We would much push much more more to move those men into the private sector. Um, I mean, there is some savings because they're only paying the $42, presumably it was on, it was on P, P back for a two-month um, regime, despite having to pay for their consultation. So the other issues, I suppose, are around those ones been identified around, you know, the testing and aligning the testing with two-monthly um, visits. You know, do you do the STI screens every four months and the, the serology every two months? Because in the public sector, all those tests cost the clinic money. So that's another kind of issue that we would have to wrestle with. Um, the other issue, I suppose, is the chasing of people. Um, we don't really chase people that much in a big clinic. Smaller clinics may have more capacity or other services may differ. But if someone doesn't come back for their um, HIV um, script, we send them one reminder and then you know, we assume they've gone elsewhere. So how would we manage that with um, Cab LA? Would we make that assumption they've gone elsewhere or would we kind of be concerned that they've dropped off and therefore have they covered the tail? All those questions would make it quite challenging and potentially, you know, a lot of staff resources would have to be devoted to some of that. And um, I suppose the last um, point I wanted to make is that, um, you know, there how long do we have to wait till someone's covered, which Ben alluded to as well, what advice, all those things I suppose will be emerge over time. We Clinicians I think are maybe more worried about the tail than maybe um, the, the users, we would be more concerned and also the breakthrough infections I guess would kind of be sitting in our minds as to um, an issue around that. I think there would be a really, a really exciting role for um, you know, self-injection and I think that would be um, there would be an opportunity there, how you would kind of confirm it, you know, I think would be open to exploration. But I think there's some potential, but um, I think there is, a in clinical services, a level of nervousness around what it would mean. Great. Thank you for that, Anna. I think, you know, one of the take-homes I've just taken from your comments is that not only are we dealing with a more expensive drug, that we may have to set up a more expensive system to, to manage this drug. And, and so uh, really we need to be thinking of ways that we can simplify these. You've, you've highlighted a couple of those that possibly um, uh, uh, possibly self-injection. Um, ben mentioned things like nurse-led services, um, trying somehow to decrease cost. And actually one of our, quest one of our comments in the chat, chat has already raised this. So let's move over to our Q&A now. So just to remind you, you can either type questions into the chat or you can raise your hand and uh, we will turn your mic on and um, you can ask your questions directly. So let's get started. I might just uh, summarize a question or two from the chat. Um, so Ad Adrian Gorringe from AVIL has an interesting question about people who might be transiting custodial settings and be at risk through sexual contact. Uh, in those settings, condoms may not be reliably available and they're going in and out of places uh, where their daily prep might be disrupted. Has, has that been thought of or do you think that might be a good setting for injectable prep? Um, any of our uh, presenters wish to so comment? It's certainly come up, Adrian. It's been mentioned in a couple of the different kind of workshops, but that's basically as far as it's gone. Someone's kind of just mentioned it and said, could this be 
I basically posed the exact question that you posed and then not much further has happened. Um, I think it would be complex with because you really have to be then engaging these custodial settings as kind of sites, um, either in a trial or eventually in, in broader rollout. Um, so we'd, there'd be some thinking that would be needed about what level of sort of expertise is needed at a, at a sort of clinician level to be able to deliver this product. And that's actually something that's unknown at this moment more broadly. We don't even know yet who's going to be allowed to prescribe this, this drug. So it might be that it's quite restricted to S100s or it might be that it's broader. But I'm sure, I mean, obviously people who are HIV positive get, can get drugs in um, prisons. So there's probably, there, there must be some way to facilitate that. But I think it's something we need to, we could do a lot more thinking about, for sure. Thanks, Ben. Anna, I think you have some experience in custodial settings, yeah. don't you? Would you like to comment? Um, yeah, I, I do work in the jails um, and have, do prescribe PrEP from time to time. It's not a huge demand for oral PrEP, but we do prescribe it for some um, prisoners. Um, I think the, so there could be a role definitely for um, prisoners who were um, incarcerated, but I think the challenge would be for those who were exiting prison and uh, transitioning out, then uh, I think the challenge would be how they were going to engage again with services because often they're in prison because of impulsive behaviours or drug use that, you know, that may make them not ideal candidates for regular attendance at health services. Thanks, Helen. Great, thank you. Um, Martin Holt from the Centre for Social Research has made a few comments about trying to reduce the cost. And, and one of these is relates to STI testing. You know, could this be an opportunity with two monthly visits to actually relax the frequency of testing to four monthly. So it would still be three times a year, um, rather than our recommendation of three months. And you know, we might we know many gay men are, are not do it, are not testing four times a year. So I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts on could this be an opportunity to move from a recommendation to for testing uh, four times a year to three times a year or every second injection visit. Yeah, this is again something that's come up at every single um, meeting and context that we've we've talked about this. And what tends to happen both when you're talking to clinicians or stakeholders or you're talking to end potential end users or end users, is that people really tend to fall into two camps. And there's it's it's quite <laughs> vehement in terms of people's views on this. So there's one group of people, including some some gay and bisexual men themselves, who are saying no way, I want as most frequent STI tests as I can possibly get. So some people are sort of saying, I'd like to have STI testing even more frequently than every three months if I could. Um, so there's that group that are sort of saying, no way, that, that sounds like a terrible idea. There's going to be all this transmission if that happens. And then there's another group that's probably a little bit more aware of this debate that's going on about how frequently we uh, test for bacterial STIs and whether we potentially over-test, which can lead to um, antimicrobial resistance at a population level. And I think they're a group that feels a lot more comfortable with this idea of potentially reducing down to maybe every second visit for this particular product, but even more, more broadly, should we actually be testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia as much as we do? So very two, two very strongly held opinions. When we went to the consultation and said, maybe this is something we could randomize in a trial and look at if, what the difference is. The feedback we got very, very strongly from, the, from everybody was you wouldn't want to randomize something like that because people have such strong views. So you wouldn't want to have to say to a patient, no, we're not going to let you actually test every, every two months. We're going to make you wait for, um, because some patients would really, really, really dislike that. So where we probably landed is in the context of a trial, what we might do is say that this would be patient and clinician choice. And together they might decide what the regularity of STI testing would be. But as Anna said, we would do serology at every visit. So we would definitely do HIV and syphilis at every visit. Anna, any, any particular views about how you might do it? Yeah, look, I think that would be reasonable to do the testing every four months. Um, to, to be honest, it's lost. It may, may be a rationale for the three months testing it, but it's lost in the midst of time um, in my mind anyway. Um, so I think it would be worth re-examining um, that. I mean, many of the men who are on, on demand prep don't attend three months because they don't have to. And uh, so there's, as, as you already said, there has been a drop off in the, I think, frequency of three monthly um, STI screening. 
Andrew, Thanks. I think it, it's it's one of those things where what we're also wanting to capture is that asymptomatic STIs that kind of come up. What we've seen, you know, and what we see is that gay men in a large part, particularly community connected gay men, have very good health seeking behaviour. And so that, you know, if they are experiencing symptoms, we definitely see people coming forward and going, oh, this isn't right. I, need, I think I need to get this checked out. So, you know, I think particularly those that are enjoying a healthy sex life that may be picking up the occasional STI, I think it is really important that they're still able to access services and get those quickly treated as quickly and as easily as possible. Um, but certainly that frequency and reducing how long people are, you know, spending in clinics or at their appointments uh, and that burden, not only to the end user in terms of time, but also the cost to the health system for all of that, I think mm. is strongly worth consideration. Great. We've got less than 10 minutes left now, and I'm going to just go quickly through a couple of comments which are worth bringing to people's attention, I think. So um, it's been noted that we should remember nurse practitioners who prescribe PrEP uh, as we're having this conversation and as we're talking about uh, PBAC restrictions or, or lack of. I think that's that's obviously really uh, an important point. Uh, another point that's been made is that perhaps we're approaching a time where we might be getting injection fatigue in the community, given uh, you know, all the injections people have had to have for COVID, uh, for, for the routinely for flu, now for monkeypox, and, and now we're asking them for it to be injected every eight weeks, that that, that may actually potentially lead to uh, some fatigue. Perhaps it could lead to the opposite. Maybe it leads to trust of injections. I, I don't know. Um, Back to a question and, and a, a query from uh, David Atifi from RPA about some of the results in the trial, which I know Ben is very on top of. So maybe I'll flick this to you, Ben, but Anna might want to comment on this as well. Uh, a question about whether the breakthrough infections in the trials had integrated resistance and implications for treatment. Yeah, so I can't remember all the numbers off the top of my head, um, but there were there was some. Um, so. The, one of the issues is that the way the data gets presented is it's presented in a segmented way, which can make it hard to really figure out the exact precise numbers of things. So what they'll do is like, obviously we know that there are four true breakthrough infections in people who had on-time injections and who had drug consultations that would suggest that they were had enough um, drug in the body. There were only four of those, but then there were more infections, as I showed on those original slides, in people who are on CAB-LA injections generally, but that included people where it was prevalent infections, where they actually already had HIV before they started the um, injections. Some people acquired HIV during the oral lead-in phase, and it's not clear whether that's because of poor adherence or because to the oral pills um, during those 28 days or something else. Um, and so then when they present the resistance data, they often present it saying, well, here's how many people got resistance and it can be hard to kind of match up. But there were a small handful of resistance infections found. Um, and I'm not a clinician, so I'm not sure fully what the implications are for ongoing treatment. So maybe Anna might want to answer that part. Mm, I, I don't know more than, more than you about those that in terms of the numbers, but I think certainly in the Cabernuva um, trials, if you became resistant to cabotegravir, it was a class resistance. So yep. it meant you could no longer use INSTI, so which is a big deal. Yeah, yep. a very big deal, isn't it? And this, this <laughs> has been an issue raised from the randomized trial that it would mean complete large scale change in your primary um, therapy of HIV. Um, and, you know, this is. In, in our setting, of course, we've been watching quite closely rates of TDF-FTC resistance and are seeing very little, very little increase. So any uh, increase in resistance to drugs used as part of our primary treatments for HIV is a big deal and obviously something we would need to keep a uh, very close eye on. In the last couple of minutes, there is one issue that's been raised, which I think is important, is whether this might have a role in... Um, uh, culturally and linguistically diverse populations of gay bisexual men. And of course, this is this is the group in whom we're having real trouble currently reducing HIV. And obviously anything extra we could do. So maybe, uh, Anna, I know you, you see a lot of uh, culturally diverse populations. Any comments from you first on, um, on the use in this population? Um, well, a lot of the people we see from those 
communities are uh, Medicare ineligible, so they wouldn't be able to transition across to this option anyway. Um, but we haven't, you know, if we want to use Cabernova um, as an example of demand, we haven't seen a huge demand from those groups where you, for a, to move across from their existing oral therapy, and presumably the issues would be the same around, you know, discretion and and pill, you know, not wanting to take pills. So, yeah, it's it's an interesting interesting to consider, but I haven't seen a demand or questioning, even people asking questions about it. But that may be there hasn't been any demand generation work going on yeah. or, as well. Mm, yeah, it certainly comes up in all the workshops that we've run, all the kind of interviews as this is a really critical group. And some people, even almost to the point of view where some people are saying, if this product wouldn't be able to be used by that really critical group, then maybe we shouldn't even bother with this product because um, if it's not going to make a difference to these people who are not who are struggling currently, then, then why should we even do it? Some that to that level of strength, sometimes it comes through. Um, in the end user workshops, we definitely found that the, the people who you can't, it's qualitative, so it's not like this is representative, but the people who are most interested in this product did tend to be culturally and linguistically diverse people. And we know from both um, in terms of overseas born and that kind of ethnically diverse and also Aboriginal, because there's some issues there around kind of remoteness and, and not wanting to carry around pills and, and so on. Um, but I think it's similar to what Anna said, where if the issue with oral prep with this group of people is engagement with the health system, and then you've got this new product that requires even more engagement with the health system. I struggled at this point to see how this particular product is really going to help with these, say, newly arrived overseas born men, or the, the question about travel has come up again, like people who are traveling back and forth really frequently. If they can ensure that the periods that they're traveling are covered by an injection, maybe that's really suitable. But if they're traveling so much that they might then miss a whole bunch of injections because of their travel, how, how good is this product going to be? And I can see the final comment there is that maybe you could potentially go to another country and then get your injection there. Well, that's going to be completely dependent on which countries get access to this drug. Yeah. And so we know that um, this is likely to become pretty widespread in sub-Saharan Africa because they're part of the medicines patent pool, very low income countries that are going to get access to really, really cheap drug. But places in Asia, places in Latin America, much less certain whether access to this drug is really going to become a reality. There are some countries that are going through regulatory approvals, um, but who knows what's going to happen and whether they're going to be funded for everybody or like some like here, whether they'd be more restricted. Lots of complex issues there with that particular population. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Complex indeed. Um, we shouldn't leave it on uh, a too negative um, uh, conclusion, I think, despite all of the issues raised today, uh, as we highlighted in the beginning, this is the first in this class of longer acting drugs. The next available in this class is not likely to be with us for at least four years. And so um, it's this is something where we could actually lead um, global developments because currently this drug is only available in the US. It's only being used in the US with a completely different system. Australia was the second country in the world to uh, register this through our regulatory agent. So we, and just Curtis has just um, um, highlighted that Zimbabwe has just approved it as well in the last few days. And we do expect because of the likely availability at affordable prices in Sub-Saharan Africa, it'll be used more broadly there than, than probably anywhere. Um, hopefully within the relatively near future, although the, the negotiations with uh, the uh, medicines patent pool for production of this are, are ongoing. So please watch this space. This is something that's going to uh, change in Australia quite quickly. Um, as uh, Ben mentioned, there is the likelihood of a implementation study, an implementation science study sometime in the next year or two, which would start the access pathway um, and, and hopefully um, working with the manufacturer, um, it will eventually progress through the pharmaceutical benefits scheme and be subsidized for at least part, some of our at-risk populations. Um, it's one minute past 11, so I'd better tie it up there, but any final comments from our panel? Any, uh, any critical comments that have been left off? 
No. So if I could just finish by thanking our presenters, I thought that was a, a great balance of presentations, really informative, and thank our uh, attendees today. Watch this space, we'll be in touch. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.